to see you. Hey, let me just start by telling you a little about what's going on with me. So there's something that happened to me when I was a kid that I don't think I've really gotten over. And I, I really think I'm traumatized by it, really. So I just figure I'm in church, so this is a good place to talk about it. Can we, can we have a conversation? Uh, so, and, and I, I always think about it around this time of the year because it happened to me the day before Easter, right? Uh, when I was a kid, I grew up uh, living with my aunt and my uncle and their three children. And they had an eldest son and two younger daughters. Their eldest son was about two years older than me. And I, I always like, kind of lived in his shadow. You know, like I was always intimidated by him. And, you know, my luck, he's listening. So, Richard, I love you. God bless you. I, I think I've forgiven you. I think. <laughs> but <clears throat> when, when I was six years old, the day before Easter, and, and let me give you some context about my cousin first. So he was that kid who, like, when we sat down at the kitchen table to eat <laughs> breakfast, like, the kids ate and the, the adults ate separate. We would sit and we would eat together. He was that kid who would break off just a small piece of his Pop-Tart and move it into the middle of the table, and then he'd look at all of us and say, make it grow. And, like, we would all have to kind of tithe some of our Pop-Tart to stay in his good care. I mean, that, that's, that's the childhood that I had. Okay, are you, are you with me? Are you with me? So when I was six years old, my aunt, she went to the store, and she, the day before Easter, she bought us both a pair of socks. Now, it's really, really important that you understand the distinction between these socks. Okay, my pair of socks was white with a green stripe. His pair of socks was white with a red stripe. You got that? Okay. So she goes, and she gives us one instruction. She says, you guys can wear these socks today, but you will be wearing them tomorrow. So don't get them dirty. And so right away, I knew exactly what that meant. Intuitively, I understood that meant I need to delay gratification. Right? I, I can't go outside today. That's what I told myself. I knew if I want to keep my, my socks white and clean and pristine, I need to stay in the house. And so I made a business decision. I'm staying in because I'm going to have white socks tomorrow. My cousin didn't really think that through. He decided to still go outside. And I, I even remember just standing at the apartment balcony watching him, judging him in my heart. As he's stomping around in the sand, kicking the mud around, I'm like, his socks are going to be dirty. <laughs> the next morning comes, and as I wake up that morning, we share a room. I wake up that morning, I crack my eyes open, and the first thing I see out of the corner of my eyes is my cousin shimmying on my socks, the white with the what? Green stripe. And so I jump up, and I'm like, no, 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 Richard, those are my socks. And he says, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what color socks my mom bought me. I'm like, no, 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 those are mine. Yours are over there. And when I pointed his socks out, they were in the corner, and they were nasty smelly, mud-crusted, just sitting there in the corner looking at me. And I'm like, no, those are your socks right there. You went outside. Those are yours. He said, nah, I'm pretty sure these are mine. I said, okay, well, I'm just going to go to my aunt. So I go to his mom, my aunt, and I tell her, hey, this is what's going on. And she goes like Switzerland on me. She's like, hey, sorry, I'm like out of this. I bought you guys socks. I don't know what happened. You're wearing them today. And I'm like, no, no, no. He went outside. Those are his mud-crusted socks. Those are his nasty, smelly socks. And she said, hey, kind of looks like those are his. He's wearing them right now. And so I'll never forget the day that I had to wear my cousin's nasty, smelly, mud-crusted socks on Easter. It's, it's kind of a problem. So pray for me. You know how that feels? I mean, maybe you don't know how it feels to wear nasty, smelly socks, or, or maybe you, you might. I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> but do you know how it feels to tell the truth that you know is truth to someone, and they just will not believe you? Do you know how that feels? I believe Jesus dealt with that with his disciples often. I believe he dealt with it no more than the disciple we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20. 
And we're going to start in verse 24. And we're going to look at an event that took place on a day a lot like today. It was a week after Easter, a week after Jesus rose from the dead. And as we're looking at the story that shows up at the conclusion of the Gospel of John, uh, we're also at the conclusion of a series that we've been calling uh, Life in the Kingdom. And we've been uh, talking about uh, finding triumph in our tests and our, in our, our testing. And most notably, early in the series, we looked at the life of Jesus and his wilderness experience, and we compared it to our own as believers. Right? And one wilderness that every believer is going to have to endure at some point is a wilderness of doubt and skepticism. We will have to wrestle with this within ourselves and within those that we know and love. And, and uh, one thing about it, and I think it's really important to say, so I want to say it up front. One thing about the wilderness for the believer is that as uncomfortable and as undesirable the wilderness is, it is incredibly rewarding when it's over. Right? And it's necessary. Because Brandon said a few weeks ago, the wilderness and the life of a believer prepares us for the danger and the difficulty of bringing kingdom to earth. Right. See, uh, the prince of the power of the air most certainly believes this is his world and his realm. Yeah. Doesn't he? So it, so anything you try to accomplish then as a representative of the kingdom will be contested. And unless you have been through and have come out of a wilderness, you will not be able to stand against the war he wages against you. You won't. Amen. You ready to pray? You guys are intense. <laughs> Father, thank you. For the people of God, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your word and your people together. Will you bless it and use it in the way that you intend? In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 Malcolm Gladwell is a Canadian author and journalist. Uh, he is a staff writer for The New Yorker. He used to be a reporter for uh, The Washington Post. Uh, he has a podcast out right now called Revisionist History. And in this podcast, he's often taking a look at things and showing us things that are uh, often overlooked and misunderstood in our culture. And he has a, an episode out uh, right now that he, he recently released. It's called The Burden of Proof. I'm going to say The Burden of Proof. So Malcolm, in this podcast, has an opportunity to do a lecture in front of the students of uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And as he steps in front of this crowd to start this lecture, he starts off with a question. Here's the question he asked. He said, what level of proof do we need about the harmfulness of some activity before we act? What level of proof do we need about the harmfulness of some activity before we act? And so I ask you the same thing, class. When it comes to proof, when do you act? In other words, when you're trying to determine the truth about a matter, do you need definitive evidence? Or can you draw conclusions using reason, rationale, and empirical proof? Uh, Malcolm, in his lecture, he introduces two men to the students of Penn. One was an early uh, 1900s senior statistician for a life insurance company, and the other was a former football player for their very own university. Uh, the senior statistician's name was Frederick Kaufman. Now, Frederick, uh, his job was to study and monitor the health of Americans and to determine what they were dying of in order to apply some sort of sophistication to what he needed to charge for insurance premiums. That's a job, right? So that's what he did for a living. And in 1918, he published a stunning report on respiratory diseases and in it, he methodically proved the damaging health effects of uh, coal mining and its contribution to the mortality rate. But nothing happened. All sorts of people looked at his report and determined that there was not enough proof and evidence. And it wasn't until the 1970s that all sorts of people started to realize that tens of thousands of miners were dying uh, these premature, horrible deaths because of the, the dust they were inhaling while they were in the mines. Now, now, can we just take a moment and acknowledge that's a horrible story, right? That, that, is, that should have never happened. Like, we should have caught this and dealt with it in, in 1918. Instead, we're dealing with it in 1975. And maybe we look around in the room today and we say, we would have never done this, would we? 
We would have never allowed this to happen. We're much too educated and, and sophisticated and empathetic to ever look at the sufferings of someone else and say, oh, no, 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 there's not enough proof. Because are quiet. Then he transitions to the next man, switches gears to the former Penn football player. His name was, first name Owen, last name Thomas. What was his last name? Thomas. Thomas. Owen Thomas was a third-generation football player. His father and his grandfather played college football. He loved football. He played it from a, a young age as a child. He was a standout high school player. And along with his extraordinary athletic prowess, he, uh, he also was incredibly brilliant, never selling for anything less than a 4.0. He was admitted to Penn's Wharton School of Business, which is a, like one of the top business schools in the country. In his junior year in college, he was named the captain of the football team. I mean, everything was going well until it wasn't. Because then, out of nowhere, Owen Thomas became this, this young man. He went from being a young man of clarity and purpose to feeling like he was failing everything. And one day, seemingly out of the blue, he hung himself in his apartment. When his parents came to identify the body, they got a call from a research group that had done extensive study in studying the brains of people who had taken repeated blows to the head. And the autopsy revealed that Owen Thomas had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or as we know it today, CTE. This uh, research group have found, they discovered in newer science, they discovered that when you get hit in the head, it causes your brain to twist and to bruise And if you get hit in the head enough times, that bruising will release a uh, a protein, it accumulates a protein called tau. And that tau moves itself slowly through your brain like a poison. This research group has done uh, uh, this research on 111 deceased former NFL players, 110 of whom had CTE. So what's being done about this proof? Nothing. We now know about football, what Kaufman knew about coal mining in 1918. Yet football still continues, Malcolm says. And the response is that we don't have definitive proof. That's the point I want to make. We don't have definitive proof is what they say. And the problem with definitive proof, especially when it comes to the well-being of people, is that if you wait for evidence to be definitive, perfect, and complete, you'll never act until the consequences are too much to bear. You just won't. The burden of proof was placed on those who could best provide uh, conclusions, credible conclusions, but when it didn't line up with what was good for business, they rejected it. And now, I present to you another Thomas. In the beginning of John chapter 20, Jesus Christ has just been crucified, killed, buried, laid in a secure grave. And his disciples decide that they want to go to his grave to grieve. And as they get there, they realize he's gone. He, he's not there. And so a few other disciples find out and they run. They find out, yes, he's gone. He's, he's not in the grave anymore. And then he starts appearing. He shows up and he appears to Mary. And then he appears to a couple of disciples on their way to Emmaus. And then he appears to Peter. He even shows up at a private meeting the disciples were having. Now, to this point, Thomas has not seen Jesus, uh, and Jesus has not shown up. He's not revealed himself to Thomas at all. And Thomas is, you know, and he, he also missed that private meeting the disciples were having, so he's just missing out. Every, you know, all of his friends are coming to him. They're saying, we've seen the Lord. He's not in the grave. We've seen him. And Thomas irrationally disregards the testimony of his trusted friends. He wants definitive proof. That's what he wants. Starting in verse 24 of chapter 20, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, as I sat down and I was preparing for this message. I started asking myself questions that I'd never asked before. 
about this. I said, well, why is this story even in the Bible? And not only why is the story in the Bible, why Thomas? Like, why is he the disciple that gets picked out for the Bible to talk about? And even more than that, why is Thomas's story the capstone of the Gospel of John? Uh, scholars and commentators argue that the next chapter, chapter 21, is a postscript. So why is the story so important? Why? I submit to you that Thomas's story is significant and important because it gives us a template of how one journeys from skepticism to belief. And so who is Thomas? Who is Thomas? What, what do we know about Thomas? We know a few things about Thomas. The first thing we know about Thomas is that Thomas was a twin, that his very name, Thomas and Didymus, uh, they both mean twin in their respective language of origin. Uh, there's no mention of his brother or sister historically, but he is known historically by that unique family dynamic. Uh, we also know that he was one of the 12. Uh, he is one of the few people that Jesus handpicks to travel with him, to minister uh, with him, and to have eyewitness testimony to his words, his wonders, and his works. We know that Thomas was a bit of a pessimist. Right? We know that he has become known and labeled all throughout church history as what? Doubting Thomas. Right? Right. Doubting Thomas. And it's all because of this one moment in John 20, 25. Like, how would you like to be identified all throughout history for your worst moment? <laughs> right? That's Thomas. Well, actually, in, in my research, uh, a few commentators actually refer to him as the Eeyore of the disciples. <laughs> I just messed up. I, that's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, another commentator calls him a heroic pessimist. And both of these stem out of his experience in John 11 when, when Jesus wanted to go to Bethany to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. All of his disciples knew the closer you get to Jerusalem, man, you're going to die. And so they're trying to talk him out of it. And when Thomas saw that Jesus couldn't be swayed, Thomas is the one who stepped up and heroically, but scholars say pessimistically said, let's all go that we may die with him. <laughs> He's, man. He doesn't say a whole lot in scripture, but, it, man, it's rough. <laughs> we also know that though he was willing to die for Jesus, he didn't want to be left behind by Jesus. Uh, and when Jesus famously says in John 14, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, it's actually in response to something that Thomas says. Because right before this, Thomas says, well, if you leave, we're not going to know where to find you. Aw. Right? So you get this sense in that moment that all the things Thomas has heard and has seen um, has not really internalized. It's, it's as if his identity is much more wrapped up in being around the miracle maker, but uh, worker, but, but there's no real miracle that has ever happened in his heart. That's what you see. We know that once Jesus was arrested and taken by force, Thomas, like the other disciples, bailed on him. Right. So all this talk about dying with him quickly went out of the window. There's nothing better than your boy saying they have your back. And then when things go down, they're nowhere to be found. Right. That Thomas, he's part of the group that did that. And then we know that upon hearing the news about Jesus' resurrection, he could not trust any testimony or proofs, but demanded to see it in order to believe it. Now, now what's today? It's Sunday. All right. It's April 28th. What's the year? Year 2019? Good. Someone got it wrong in first service. So, okay. So we're more than 2,000 years removed from this event in history. So I cannot give you what Thomas wanted. Right? I can't present to you Jesus Christ in the flesh with scars in his hand and a hole in the side. I can't do that. I cannot give you definitive proof. But I want you to consider this. If belief in God for you is not a thing, and you're a skeptic, and you're wrong, the cost to you is much higher than miners' asthma that took the lives of 10,000s of people in the 1900s, isn't it? Like, it's much higher to you uh, than, than the devastating impact of CTE on the, on the heads and brains of, of football players. We're talking about eternal separation from God. Uh, let me get a little less fire and brimstone on you. I don't know if you guys can handle it. Let me put the conundrum in a different light. If you receive word that you have a very distant relative that left you an inheritance of an extraordinary value, one that would completely change your family tree, 
financially upon receipt. As unbelievable as that sounds, you would have to investigate it, right? You would have to investigate. You have to do something about it. And so here's the point that I want to make, and I want you to understand this. This is the one I want you to carry as you go out of here, is that when it comes to belief in God, the burden of proof about Jesus is on you. The burden of proof about Jesus is on you. The cost of being wrong is too high. It just is. I believe the point Gladwell was making in his podcast is that skeptics will remain skeptics so long as they're committed to their position. Proof means nothing to someone who does not want to be swayed. Why? Because they really do believe their positions. And I'll even say this, you'd be shocked how much what you want to believe plays into whether you believe something or not. Amen. And so the story of, of Thomas offers a challenge to both skeptics and believers. All right. So a few challenges. The, the, the challenge to the skeptic is to doubt your doubt. Doubt your doubt. Uh, don't leave the burden of proof of Christianity on others. Compare the evidence and rationale of Jesus to your own belief and then decide what makes more sense. So that's the challenge to you if you're a skeptic today. Uh, the challenge to the believer is don't be afraid to wrestle with your own doubts. Don't, don't be afraid. God can handle it. Right? God knows you enough. He understands you enough. And he loves you enough for you to approach him with an uncensored heart. It, it's okay. Not only that, it'll, it'll actually push you into a richer relationship with Jesus if you wrestle. Okay, you're invited to do that today. And so a belief in Christianity uh, comes to make sense when we see three things. All right, belief in Christianity comes to make sense when we see, number one, the faith that takes to doubt it, the problems you have without it, and the beauty we see within it. All right, the faith that takes to doubt it, the problems we have without it, the beauty we see within it. Now, I don't have time to go over and address number one and number two today with you. But, but if that is of interest to you, please come see me after service. I'd love to get a resource in your hand. All right. So uh, the faith that takes doubt it, the problems we have without it, I don't have. But come, come and see me if you need that. But I do want to camp for the rest of our time together that we have on the third part, the beauty we see within it. Because I do believe that it, it, um, it appeals, it pertains to our text and our subject. Amen? Amen. All right. So. Starting in verse 26 of, of chapter 20, it says, After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. So belief in God and Christianity has a beauty to it. Uh, it, it answers major questions for us, like where do we come from and where are we going? Uh, and what's wrong with us? I, I have some friends at work. I work for a telecommunications company. And so we get like really, 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 really cheap cable and with it we get premium channels and uh, so all my friends at work are always trying to talk me into watching the HBO series Game of Thrones and uh, and so when I ask them okay what's so good about this show what they say to me is that they are fascinated with how the show does such a good job of revealing both the evil and the good of their major characters and they talk about how that you know everyone has blood on their hands Right? But the show does such a good job of giving you their story and their perspective that you actually begin to understand them and even root for them, even though they're all essentially horrible people. Right? <laughs> right. Is, that, is that how the show goes? You're going to admit it in church. I love you. See, this is why I love this church. This is why I love this church. And for those of you who didn't admit it, you know, tell the truth and shame the devil. No, I haven't seen it. But what I can say is, when they tell me about the show, and it's like every week they come in talking about it, I crack, I laugh. And the reason why is because it sounds a lot like the gospel to me. Like it sounds a lot like Christianity. Like Christianity is a redemption story. Like Christianity is about a king, God, who comes off his throne in order to redeem us despite our evil, right? And so it's just funny to me when they're talking about that. 
You know, a pastor uh, was confronted by a believer who said to him, I will believe in God if you give me a watertight argument. To which the, the pastor said to him, we'll read the New Testament. And the man clapped back, is there a watertight argument in there? And the pastor said, well, not exactly. But there is Jesus Christ. And then he said to the man, what if God did not give us a watertight argument to lead him to himself, but instead gave us a watertight person against whom there is no argument? Read him and you'll see. There's almost no way to account for the beauty of this person except if maybe he is who he says he is. Jesus himself is the main argument for why we should believe in God. The man that Christians call Jesus Christ is the most influential person who ever lived. All the armies that ever marched, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned have never had more impact on the world than this one singletary life. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is one of my heroes. And uh, one of the things he says about Jesus that I just absolutely love, he says this, he says, evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross. But one day that same Christ will rise up and split history in A.D. and B.C. so that even the life of Caesar will have to be dated by his name. And so it's because of the beauty of Jesus in four areas that you do not have to see him to believe him. I want to give those to you real quickly. Four areas. The first area is Jesus' character. Are you still with me? Jesus' character, the beauty of Jesus' character. In Jesus, we see qualities and virtues we would ordinarily consider incompatible in the same person. Uh, We would never think they can be combined, but because they are in Jesus, they are strikingly beautiful. Tim Keller uh, explains him this way. He says, Jesus combines high majesty with the greatest humility. He joins the strongest commitment to justice with astonishing mercy and grace. And he reveals transcendent self-sufficiency and yet entire trust in and reliance upon his heavenly father. We are surprised to see tenderness without weakness, boldness without harshness, humility without uncertainty, indeed accompanied by towering confidence. Readers can discover for themselves his unbending convictions, but complete approachability, his insistence on truth, but always bathed in love, his power without insensitivity, his integrity without rigidity, his passion without prejudice. Listen, Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus uh, deliberately and tenderly touched lepers. Uh, He ate repeatedly with the Pharisees. He was not bigoted towards the bigoted. He forgave his enemies even as they were crucifying him and even his friends who abandoned him in his greatest hour of need. He loved them. One of my uh, favorite stories of Jesus, just a really, it it happens so quickly you may miss it if you're reading scripture. One of my favorite stories of Jesus is Jesus is being apprehended. Okay, they are arresting him. They're about to take him away. And as they arrest him and they start to take him off, Peter picks up a sword and he slashes the ear off of the guy that's arresting Jesus. And Jesus shockingly, in so many words, says to Peter, no, 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 Peter. And he goes down, he picks up the ear, and he puts it back on the guy's head and heals him. And then, like, carries on being detained. It's like, who are you? It's the beauty of his character. The second beauty of Jesus is his claims. There's the beauty of his claims. Jesus was constantly claiming and bringing attention to his divinity. There's no better proof that he claimed to be God than his encounters with the religious system of the day. Uh, In John 10, Jesus um, emphatically says it out loud. He says, I and the Father are one. And as he does this, uh, the Jewish leaders are picking up stones. They're, they want to kill Jesus. And Jesus asks them, hey, why are you trying to kill me? And they say to him, because of blasphemy. You, a mere man, are claiming to be God. It was no mistake to them what Jesus was doing. You're claiming to be God. Later, Jesus is put on trial, and the high priest asks, tell us if you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus responds, you have said it. And I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. 
See, the reason they hated him, the reason they harassed him, the reason they put him on trial, the reason they crucified him, the reason is because he kept claiming to be God, and the only way to stop him was to kill him. And when they did, they expected him to stay in the grave. They expected him to become a, a nasty, smelly, mud-crusted corpse. But he didn't stay there. He got up three days later proving, in effect, that it was true. He proved his claims to be true. And so there's the beauty of his character. There's the beauty of his claims. There's the beauty, then, also of his resurrection. N.T. Wright asserts that the resurrection has much attestation as any other historical, ancient historical event. Billy Graham said it this way. He says, there's more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived and that Alexander the Great died at age 33. Both, by the way, historians say are, are instant, disputable fact. And so this moment that we're looking at in John chapter 20 uh, this moment where, where Jesus rises from the dead and then he walks through walls to stand face to face with Thomas. This moment is happening. It, it reveals all of it in one. It proves and it deals with the beauty of his character, the validity of his claims, and the reality of his resurrection all in one moment. Thomas experiences and encounters it all right in that moment. Thomas learns in that moment that there is nowhere I can go in my pain, and in my shame, and in my doubts, and in my skepticism that God can't meet me. And he figures it out right there. See, God is relational, not transactional. Okay? He wants to walk with you through your doubt, through your pain, through your shame, through your skepticism. He doesn't want to just make it go away. Like, I, listen, I will never forget. I will never forget the day I got, I got saved. I'll never forget when I gave my life to Jesus. I probably wept for about an hour and a half, two hours straight. Why? Because the beauty of Jesus in that moment, what would reveal, and I didn't need anyone to preach a sermon to me. I didn't need anyone to tell me the, the, the character of Jesus and the claims of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. I just knew in that moment, experientially, something happened. And is this kind of love? Is this kind of care by a personal God who would actually, like Ryan said, who would actually come into the pit with us, who would come down in, who wouldn't just lift us out, but would come in and get dirty with us? Is this kind of love by a personal God that enables us to be his faithful representatives? And so that's the fourth one, the beauty of his representatives. Come on, Jason. Now, notice that when Jesus showed up among his disciples after his death, burial, and resurrection, he authenticated himself to his disciples by showing off his scars. All right, notice that. That he told Thomas, see, put your hand, put your fingers in the holes of my wrist and put your hand in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. His scars enabled him to prove that it was him. See, scars are a place in our lives where pain has left a permanent mark. And so it's interesting to note, though, that Jesus went out of his way to show off his scars and how we work overtime to hide ours, don't we? Like, we don't want people to know that we're hurting. We don't want people to know that we're vulnerable in any way or that we're struggling at all. Isn't that how we work? But Jesus showed off his, his scars. And I want you to think about this. Thomas knew Jesus very well. He knew Jesus. He, he was around Jesus a lot. He spent a lot of time with him. He even watched uh, Jesus do remarkable things for others. But it was not until Thomas encounters the resurrected Lord. It was not until uh, Thomas saw and witnessed Jesus' triumph over suffering that he really believed. I want to tell you something. You have people around you that you want to see get their life to Christ. You have people you want uh, around you that you want to see experience life in the kingdom. You have people around you, you want to see them come to the Lord. You know when the best opportunity for that is? Is when you're suffering. It's when you're struggling. Like people expect you to be happy when you, when you should be happy, right? But when you're going through something, right? When people see that you have a resource 
that allows you to have joy and hope when you absolutely should not have it. That gives them pause to cause. They'll know something is going on. And this is what Thomas was dealing with in that situation. Thomas was a witness to Jesus' suffering. And that's what made Jesus' resurrection so much more impactful. If you fast forward this, history says that Thomas, doubting Thomas, was one of the most significant disciples after the resurrection. Of all the apostles, Thomas represents most profoundly the missionary zeal associated with the rise of Christianity. He is historically said to have become a missionary to India in 52 AD, and there he planted seven churches and reached more than 17,000 people. They received Christ before he was martyred around 72 AD. Something happened to Thomas. That brother snapped. (laughs) Something happened. Tupac Shakur was an iconic asset transition right there. <laughs> Tupac Shakur was an iconic hip hop artist. Uh, he is considered by many to be one of the greatest rappers of all time. Uh, and one of his greatest works, in my opinion, is actually a poem that he wrote about himself called The Rose That Grew Up From Concrete. And this is a poem that I believe. Uh, represents very well the people of God. I I really do believe that. But Tupac grew up in the ghettos of Harlem, New York, Baltimore, Marin City, California. And as his musical talent began to produce fame and fortune for him, he began to get reflective about his journey. And this is what he said in that poem. He said, you see, you wouldn't ask a rose that grew up out of concrete why it had damaged petals. On the contrary, we would celebrate its tenacity. We would love its will to reach the sun. Well, we are the roses. This is the concrete. These are my damaged petals. Don't ask me why. Ask me how. If you ever see the biological impossibility of a rose that has grown from concrete, you will not wonder why its petals are damaged, but you will instead marvel of how it emerged from the concrete in the first place. And since Jesus Christ was the first rose that grew from the concrete, we as his representatives can do the same. We can. The concrete of hardship is a fact. Jesus said in this life, there will be trouble. We are going to have to rise up out of impossible situations. And when you do, people around you will celebrate your tenacity. They will love your will to reach the sun. So don't, don't, don't get too distracted by your damaged petals. Don't, don't put too much focus on your damaged petals because they are just the beautiful scars that authenticate the goodness of God in your life. I mean, do do you know that for all eternity, Jesus will bear the scars of his crucifixion on his body? That forever, it'll be an astonishing reminder of the infinite cost he paid for us. And so in the same way, not only is the burden of proof about Jesus on you to investigate as truth, but the burden of proof about Jesus is on you, literally. It's on you. You bear them for all to see. God created you to be marveled at. As his representative, he wants to heal you and empower you to show off his glory. Amen. So what level of proof do you need about the harmfulness of some activity before you act? Can you honestly look at the sufferings of Jesus, the nail scars in his hands, the holes in his side, and determine that you need more evidence? Listen, this this often overlooked and misunderstood Savior can absolutely revise, clarify, 
and make your history his story if you let him in. Jesus is the one true God. Right? He, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the living water. He is the water type person against whom there is no argument. He, he, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the king who came off his throne in order to redeem us despite our evil. And it most certainly was not a game. He is the rose that grew from concrete. He was damaged and scarred on your behalf at infinite cost to himself. The burden of proof about Jesus is on you. It's on you to doubt your doubt and weigh out the evidence. And it's on you literally. The scars you bear as a result of your life's journey is a testimony of God's presence and goodness in your life. Amen. Thomas knew life in the kingdom. And we know that he experienced triumph over trials because when he saw Jesus face to face, he proclaimed one of the greatest declarations of Jesus' divinity in all of Holy Scripture. He said, my Lord and my God. And we as the people of God, when we emerge out of the wilderness of doubt and skepticism, we too will have the same testimony and revelation in and upon our hearts. Amen. We're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, Jason and I want to share a piece of art with you. Uh, this song sounds a lot like something that could be the soundtrack of, soundtrack of Thomas's life post-resurrection. Uh, it's written from the perspective of a man who has come to the end of himself, and all he wants to do now is boast in the Lord and glorify God. One of the lines in the song, uh, at the very end, it says, I live to show your glory. I die to tell your story. And, and I can just imagine that blessed day when Thomas was being martyred for the faith. I can just imagine right before he gets uh, pierced by a spear in the same way that his Lord and Savior had been. I, I can just see him having a flashback of his experience with Jesus, that resurrected experience with Jesus. And I can see right as he's dying, laying there dying, that his dying breath, he says those very words. I live to show your glory. I die to tell your story. Psalm 44, 8 says, In God we make our boast all day long, and we will praise your name forever. This song is called Boasting. anything to gain at all I count it lost if I can't hear you I feel you cause I need you can't walk this earth alone I recognize I'm not my own before I fall I need to hear you I feel you as I live to make my boast in you alone with every breath I take with every heartbeat sunrise and the moonlights in a dark street Every glance, every dance, every note of a song, it's all a gift undeserved that I shouldn't have known. Every day that I lie, every moment I covet, I'm deserving to die, I'm just earning your judgment. I, without the cross, it's only condemnation. If Jesus wasn't executed, there's no celebration. So in times that are good, in times that are bad, for any times that I had it all, I will be glad. And I will boast in the cross, I will boast in my pains, I will boast in the sunshine, boast in his rain. What's my life if it's not praising you? Another dollar in my bank account of vain pursuit. I do. I count my life as any value or precious at all. Let me finish my race. Let me answer my call. If this life has anything to gain at all, I count the thoughts if I can hear you, feel you, cause I need you. Can't walk this earth alone. Tomorrow's never promised, but it is, we swear. Think we're holding our own, just a fistful of air. And God has never been obligated to give us life. If we fought for our rights, we'd be in hell tonight. Mere sinners hold nothing but a fierce hand. We 
never loved him. We pushed away his tears hands. I rejected his love, grace, kindness, and mercy. Dying of thirst, yet willing to die thirsty. Eternally worthy, how can I live for less? Patiently, you turn my heart away from selfishness. I volunteer for your sanctifying surgery. I know the Spirit's purging me of everything that's hurting me. Remove the veil from my darkened eyes. So now every morning I open your word and see the sunrise. I'm hoping nothing, boasting nothing, only in your suffering. I live to show your glory. I die to tell your story. This life has anything to gain. Yeah. I can't be lost if I can hear you. Yeah. Feel you. I need you, can't hold on to this earth alone I recognize I'm not my own Before I walk, yeah. yeah. I need to hear you To feel yeah. you, as I need to take, take it my to the bridge, take it to the bridge you alone, glory was so glory. meant for you Doing what no one else you know can do, do All I have yeah. to give, I all I have to give I'll use my lips, I'll use my lips, Lord I'll only glory in your word. I'll only glory in your word. I'll live in such a way. Yeah. Give you my praise, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. I count it lost. Hear you. Hear you. Yeah. Can't alone. I recognize, Lord. I'm not my own. say to yourself, how in the world did I end up at a concert? I'm going to teach you guys how to clap. I'm going to teach you how to get some rhythm. I promise that. If you're here today and you say, Sean, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I've been a skeptic for too long. I've doubted for a long time. But I'm ready to acknowledge, like Thomas did, I'm, a, I'm ready to acknowledge him as my Lord and my God. If that's you, just slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you. Slip your hand up. Slip your hand up. Listen, the cost to follow him will never compare to the cost he paid to save you. I just want to pray for you. Just slip your hand up. Slip it up. So you're waiting for, for me to stop, right? You're, you're feeling uncomfortable right now, right? And you think it's me, but it's not. It's actually the Spirit of God on the inside of you giving you a push notification. Slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. You're here, and you say, Sean, I'm a believer. I've been walking with God for some time now, but... I've been wrestling with doubt. I've been in a wilderness for a long time. And I'm ready to snap like Thomas did. I'm ready to walk with the Lord, boast in him alone. If you would say that, just slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you as well. So I see more hands across the way. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you over there. I see you over there. So as our prayer team comes forward, we're just going to pray for you. transaction you're relational and you desire to come into our mess into our pit you come into our world and you bear witness Lord to your character to your claims to your resurrection and even you use us your representatives and so may we walk out of here today boasting 
for those who are saying for the first time, Lord, I want to know you. I want to acknowledge you as my Lord, my God. I thank you for them, Lord, and I pray that you would forgive them of their sins, cleanse them of all unrighteousness, and help them, Lord, to walk with you, Lord God. Help them to have that resurrected life that you give us. We just thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' name. And everyone said,